After months of negotiations, there is finally an agreement between Greece and the Eurozone. It is not a good agreement, but we have no time for a politics of melancholia. The question we have to ask today is not only what should Greece do, but also in particular, what should the rest of Europe do to relaunch a radical process of change in our continent? This is the question we discuss today in Athens, in the context of Democracy Rising Global Conference. And this is the question we discuss with Kostas Duzinas, acclaimed Greek intellectual and professor of law at Birkbeck College, Margarita Tsomou, Greek performer, writer and public commentator based in Berlin, Jerome Rus, author and founder of Roar magazine, and Zrechko Horvat, Croatian philosopher and member of the board of European Alternatives. Welcome to Talk Real. Is it still possible to call oneself a pro-European and be in favor of ideals of democracy, of equality, of solidarity, of justice? This is the question that Owen Jones posed recently on The Guardian. Syriza has answered yes. I want to start by asking this question to you, Costas. Why is it that the level of the struggle that Syriza has, has identified is the European level? And do you agree with that? Sure. Let me start by saying that when we talk about the European Union, we should not use the word Europe. The idea of Europe, which is an old idea uh, that comes out of the Enlightenment and the dialectic of the Enlightenment, is much wider than the European Union. Indeed, calling the European Union Europe is a huge and violent metonymy that I think you know, sort of should be abandoned. So we're talking about the European Union. It is true that the Syriza government and the Syriza party has accepted that staying in Europe, in the European Union at this point in time, is an important political choice. The European Union, as it was created in the uh, 50s and the 60s, the common market as we used to call it, was the outcome of a major compromise in the post-World uh, World War period between capitalism and democracy, between the principle of market distribution of the economic prod product and democratic distribution of the economic prod product, which follows a principle of social justice. So we had the principle of market distribution, a principle of social justice distribution. And those two came together in an easy compromise, a kind of cohabitation, which I think moved uh, the European Union forward for the first 20 or 25 years of its existence. At this point, that kind of compromise is at risk because the market principle, market distribution of the social product is now becoming dominant. And it is important, I think, for those of us who believe that the old idea of the Enlightenment, of justice and democracy and solidarity should be revived. And it is now on the left to try and fight to revive that principle and for that to reform the European Union. Margarita. Uh, yes, I think it makes uh, sense uh, in the first step to take uh, the fight in the European level since the crisis is not a Greek crisis but a European crisis. So it made completely sense that uh, you fight in this frame. Uh, in this currency and with these institutions. Uh, the question now is, was it successful to fight from within? And here I have to say we have to be clear, and um, Syriza says it as well, that it was not successful. What we saw is that the fight for another Europe in this framework was clearly defeated. And I want to quote only one um, phrase from the new memorandum uh, that clearly says, in terms of democracy, because we're talking about democracy, every law that is proposed in Greece has to first pass by the institution, and if they are okay with it, then they are um, okay with passing it through Greek parliament. This means Greek parliament can just um, Yes, agree on what the Troika says. It's a, a fact, fact abolition, yes, 
of uh, national sovereignty, of democratic sovereignty as we knew it, and it's written down uh, like this. So for me, we have to be clear in order to uh, continue and reorientate that it was a defeat trying to, de to do this in this framework, at least uh, in, in the balance of forces that we have in Europe at the moment. The only thing I think what uh, happened now through all this uh, fight uh, of Syriza inside uh, this framework is that the masks had fallen, have fallen. That uh, we have a delegitimation of this European framework. Um, it is actually what Ulrich Beck has been saying in his last book, uh, Deutsches Europa, the German Europe. He says we have a situation where uh, there is strong power but low legitimation for uh, states uh, at the moment in, uh, in governance in Europe, but uh, there is high legitimation but no power um, uh, on the side of the movements. So let's go step by step and answer those questions. Uh, Jerome, back to you with the idea, can one still be of the left and European? I think absolutely. I think one can be very European, but I think, like Costa said, we have to make a very important distinction between Europe and the European Union as such. And we might make even an extra distinction between the European Union and the European Monetary Union. And I think if we actually look at the evolution and the construction of the Monetary Union, it was constructed not just without the social justice principle in mind, but actually with a deliberate purpose to shield decision making from popular pressures from below. And I think it's very important to keep in mind that the very construction of the monetary union had anti -democratic, its anti-democratic nature embedded within it by its very logic, on purpose. Uh, if you look at the ECB, for instance, it was meant to be an independent institution without any countervailing power um, that could potentially you know, push it in one direction or another. It was supposed to be an independent bank, which is in reality just a, you know, a veil for its own dependence on the markets and the financial markets and its, its close connections with the private sector. So I think that's a very important uh, thing that we should uh, definitely throw in there, that one can be European, that one might even wage a struggle at the level of the European Union, but that, that does not necessarily mean that one should stick with the single currency as such. <laughs> okay, since I'm the last one in this round, uh, and since we are in Greece watching over the Acropolis and so on, let me start uh, by by a scene from Costa Gavra's uh, movie Capital, I don't know if you watched it, uh, where there is a brilliant scene also around the table, people are sitting, uh, and there comes the director of a huge French bank, and his uncle, and his uncle is an old 68 guy, and he accuses uh, his uh, nephew uh, of the Greek crisis and so on, you big banks are ruining countries with indebtedness and so on, and you know what the director says? his nephew, he says, but we are making your dreams true. I'm, and this guy on the other side of the table is a 68 guy and he's completely perplexed and asks, but how do you mean we are making your, how do you make our dreams true? And he says, you know, you wanted an international and our banks are international. And I think this is the first prob problem we have to face and in the, especially in the framework of, of the last agreement uh, 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 between Syriza and the so-called institutions who are now again renamed into, into the Troika. In the sense, I, I completely agree with all of you that uh, uh, yes, a European left still makes sense, but the real question is, does it make sense to fight uh, in, inside of the Eurozone? And I think what has been shown cre clearly with Syriza, that it was an illusion that we can change the institutions from inside. Of course, I don't think now the fight is over yet, but it brings us back actually to the late 60s when Rudy Dutschke said we need something like the lange march toward the institution and the long march through the institutions. And we also know how Dutschke ended up and how the German Greens ended up. And I think this could be a scenario for Syriza as well. In the sense now everyone accuses uh, Syriza of, of a defeat and so on. And I think they should say first, these were our failures and name the failures. But we should learn from the failures and not you know, be, be in this left melancholia to say a left party doesn't make any sense, a European left doesn't make any sense. So I should think we should learn from, from, from the experience of Syriza. Starting from that and linking to what Margarita said in her intervention, you made me think of the very famous quote by, by Mao Zedong, uh, revolution is not a dinner party. And did anybody here expect that in six months, a radical government from the weakest member of the Eurozone 
would have the power to radically transform, to revolutionize the governance structures of the European Union. Was anybody so deluded that thought this could happen when we come from a past where Francois Hollande was elected president of one of the most powerful countries of the European Union with a specific mandate of changing the economic governance of the Union. Nowhere near as revolutionarily as Tsipras uh, uh, promised. And even he failed in modifying by a zero point, few points per few percentage points, the economic governance of, of the Eurozone. So if we introduce a different temporality and we see the situation that we're now inhabiting in Greece as a battle in a much longer uh, change, a much longer time frame of change, a revolutionary time frame, does that help us to change the rhetoric and the discussion and to uh, contrast this politics of melancholia, which seems to be very much focused on the moment, on the instant. We haven't achieved all that we set out to now, and hence it is all impossible. Yes. Uh, could I, however, somehow uh, put this question in a slightly different perspective? I don't think that the Syriza government ever claimed they were so megalomaniacal that they hoped or expected that within the first five months, or indeed within the first four years, they were going to change the EU architecture. I mean, that was not in the cards, and they never claimed that. Uh, you know, what they uh, argued, uh, that like Croatia, were part of the periphery of Europe now, and I think Italy, and certainly Spain, and Portugal, part of the periphery of uh, Europe. And what I think they argued was that a certain understanding of the importance of democratic elections, of referenda, of the participation of people in, uh, in the political struggle and social mobilization might start changing, not, again, the architecture, not the way in which the European Parliament is a talking shop. I mean, we know that. I mean, people talk about the democratic deficit. It is a euphemism. There is no bloody democracy at all at that, uh, at that institutional level. So, the, in a sense, what Syriza promised, and perhaps overvalued uh, its ability to do, but was still in early days, was not so much that somehow you know, they were going to start a new constitutional process in which Europe would change. What I think it promised, explicitly and implicitly, was that it would become a catalyst uh, that social movements and public opinion in European countries which are subjected to that kind of regime that you rightly describe would start moving within their own space, with their, their own political environment, trying to put pressure on their governments. So it was not so much about the European Union change in that kind of structure, it was about using the tools that brought Syria to power in this country. The huge resistances over five years. This is what I think uh, you know, Syriza promised, and its presence catalyzed or started catalyzing in Europe. Yeah, I agree uh, with the um, image of the, the catalyst. Um, and it depends on where do we think the tools are there for us to use. So if we think on an institutional or governance level, a catalyst would be that there is um, shiftings in existing parties. Um, this means, for example, for Germany, since I'm based there, uh, shiftings in the Social Democratic Party, which is not really the case, not yet at all. We have uh, Sigmar Gabriel, who actually um, competes with Merkel to be the, the bigger um, and the stronger uh, hegemon than Merkel. And actually, the, in Germany, the, um, the polls uh, give him right. So people like this uh, you know, hard hegemon, German hegemon. Uh, so in social democracy, we have not seen shifts from this catalyst. Uh, what about the Greens? The Greens... Um, uh, had a big uh, campaign for the yes uh, in Greece. So they, they uh, had a Greek campaign for the Greek people to vote yes from Germany. You know, they intervened in the referendum for a yes. Uh, now they're also indignated because they, they know their basis is indignated. But um, 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure what will, what will happen there. Uh, the only thing that I see uh, happening is that you have the movements that were already there, that are strengthened, and that are also transnationalized. So, for example, um, I was uh, surprised to see that the mobilizations for solidarity for Greece at the moment in Spain they use hashtag 50M from the uh, occupation indignados. the indignados it's hashtag 50M hashtag ohi Greek no hashtag no troika and hashtag this is a coup so it is all I think that's a good image of understanding that it's all thought together yes as one transnational fight but this is movements um, that are not even social movements, I would say, it's society in movement, which is a good thing. Um, I think with this term of society in movement that we have also in Greece, um, this is, I think, the only uh, chance, but the big questions there is how we organize and how do we institutionalize these societies in movement that are radicalized and that are transnationalized. So this would be, I think, the next step to ask, how do we organize and how we institutionalize this indignation? Can I ask you, John, to take forward this line of reasoning? Yeah, um, I can try. But I would also want to get back to your question for just a second, because I had two things to say on that. I mean, you asked, basically, um, who was expecting uh, cities that to completely transform Europe in a matter of five, six months? No I think the answer is no, no one. No one. Um, not even cities, of course. Not even cities, of course not. But I think also a few people, um, I mean there were some, but a few people were expecting the um, extreme reaction from Europe and the scale of the defeat, let's say. And I don't like to talk in terms of, you know, some words are going around like betrayal or total capitulation. I don't know what to call this. But I think that one thing is clear is that the strategy of the government that they used since the beginning has failed. And it has failed quite miserably. Um, it's been a really hard crash. And I think this speaks to some extent to our contemporary powerlessness more than anything else. Um, and this connects to the second part that I wanted to say, which kind of is about the longer term perspective that you indicated that we would need. Um, I feel that, you know, there's been, in the last 10, 15 years on the left, there's been two paradigms almost, you know? Change the world without taking power or change the world by taking power, you know? And these two have been battling it out since the global justice movement, uh, the Genoa days. And it's kind of been like, you know, as if they're somehow opposed to one another and mutually exclusive. And I think actually what we should try to do is not even bring them together, but rather transcend sort of this dichotomy and perhaps start speaking in terms of building power. Um, because what we find is that um, neither without taking power nor with taking power are we capable of asserting um, our force as the left uh, in, in transforming that into material outcomes that actually benefit the majority of the people and that restore a sense of democracy. So I think the real challenge that we face moving forward at the European level, at the national level, at the local level, is to actually build popular power, to build those institutions, those organs, those organizations of popular power. And the real question that we're going to have to answer in the time moving forward is what form could that take? Um, that's just one of the things that I wanted to say, and that of course also connects with the question of the movements, right? Because the movements will have to play a very important role in that. Clearly. The real question for the left today is again internationalism. And from my experience, and this is the Croatian Yugoslav experience, there was something, some once upon a time called the non-aligned movement. And this is the year where we have the 60th anniversary of Bandung. And what is missing is precisely this, you know, you have seen that Greece was completely alone. So in the sense, it's not only a failure of the Greek government, it's a failure of the Croatian people, the failure of the German people, the failure of the Spanish people, uh, Italian people, and so on. So we shouldn't say what Syriza didn't do, but what did it, what did we do actually during this whole period? Syriza cannot do it alone, you know. And the Spanish elections are in November or, or I don't know even even further away. I mean, what will we do in the meantime? But let me come in in, in this, and I totally agree uh, with your point that the negotiation strategy of Syriza failed. You know, there is no doubt about. But uh, apropos the discussion we just had in this round, the biggest failure of Syriza, from my point of view, was that it did not try to revive or to help revive 
both from the party position but also to a certain extent from the state position, although there are always you know, major difficulties there, that social movement, mm-hmm. that popular mobilization that brought Syriza to power. That is the greatest problem for me. Okay, it happened with the referendum, right? Indeed, Again, indeed the degree. referendum, as I have argued repeatedly, directly links to Syntagma, mm-hmm. to Syntagma 2011. And you remember we were together both on the Friday when Tsipras spoke and on the Sunday in the celebrations, and you could see there that it was the people themselves, in a sense even against the government, that came together and brought this result. There was an aspect of direct democracy, not just in the institutional sense that the referendum is the most direct democratic institution within a parliamentary democracy, in the proper direct democracy sense. Now, that is what happened in the referendum. The people, in a proper direct democratic way, mobilized, took the struggle in their own hands, outside of government and even outside the party, and in that sense, we moved from Syntagma 2011 to Syntagma 2015, and this is a great hope for the future. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with this. I think it was uh, extremely important. The social mobilization that came after the calling of the referendum unleashed certain social forces that were even unexpected by the government itself, you know. But I think this even hints at something even more interesting, which is that, you know, this was already there. The people wanted to assert themselves into the main social and political scene. There was a strong desire to participate, and it was basically the disempowering element of the negotiations that were keep, keep keeping people waiting, that made people sort of unsure how to react, constantly waiting for the next deadline and seeing how the government will respond to the next thing. So I think it's very, very crucial that Tsipras took the decision to the people. Sure. Um, sadly, it was done with a set of certain ambiguity um, of what it would mean if people were to vote no, and this allowed also later on for the demobilization um, of this popular enthusiasm because people were no longer sure exactly what the Ochi meant. Did it mean a wholesale rejection of austerity, a wholesale rejection of ultimatums and financial blackmail? Or was it just an Ochi to that very particular technical document that was presented on the 26th of June and that was rejected uh, as an ultimatum by, by uh, the Prime Minister? But, you know, to come in a little more theoretically here, mm-hmm. we know from the tradition of the left that every time that constituent power becomes constituted, there is always a falling away, mm-hmm. a falling down. Mm-hmm. You know, the power of the people that brings a government into into uh, into government uh, into power, or the power of the people that reproduces society through social labor, when it starts becoming institutionalized, loses that kind of edge. And this is what happened, I'm afraid, after January 2015. Mm-hmm. And this is the big, in a sense. Uh, the big bet, the big wager with uh, the Syriza government in the middle. How you can help, not revive, because the constituent power is there. Mm-hmm. It showed itself mm-hmm. in the most amazing way on the 5th of July. How you can help, you know, help that come out again, come out, and to what extent you can actually devolve large parts of even state power to those constituent social movements and mobilization that can take us through. It, it actually brings us back to what Jerome and I would agree with you. Uh, it brings us back to what you said. You know, uh, as far as I see it, today we, we witness really a special historical situation. And to be more theoretical, we have a combination between horizontality and verticality. And I think Syriza is the brilliant, uh, brilliant example where even theories such as Negri and Hart are now speaking about the, the, the necess- necessity of leadership and so on. But I think that the people in this country, in Greece, are now even more ready for some things than the government is. And you know, you have to use it and it brings us back to this sort of dialectics with that, which I think today is the most important thing, the dialectics between verticality and horizontality, how to keep the energy of social movement. Okay, I completely agree with all that. We have discussed it among us uh, also a lot of time. Uh, I would also uh, like to point out the point that the no also was for people a potential Brexit. They knew that voting the no might be a horizon of a Brexit and they still did it 
because they risked more actually than the government is wants the responsibility to have to risk. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I think, the people are ready to take their lives in their hands as they were also formulating. It's a phrase that the indignados actually started uh, to say. And as you are saying, and as you are saying, to dissolve state, to combine, you know, governance with this uh, self-organization in society. This is crucial because I think the only, it, we have in Greece now this big pole of the no, a new political pole, as I said. This is the backbone of the Syriza government, and this is the backdrop for every politics that Syriza government uh, will do. And if Syriza does not satisfy the desire of this new political pole, then we have a danger, okay? The danger is that all this delegitimation and all this non-satisfaction goes to the right. And the right is, in Europe, they are ready. They are waiting in front of this door to come in. I want to ask uh, a couple of you, before rounding it off, uh, a question on popular power uh, and the catalyst that you, Margarita, were mentioning before. Uh, Greece is fighting not only on behalf uh, of the Greeks, but it is fighting on behalf of Europeans. And it is fighting for a vision of a different alternative Europe. The question, where are European movements, where are the peoples of Europe in this fight, is a question that I still would want to pose. Why is it still so difficult in Europe today to make an equivalence between uh, the necessity of helping Greece and the necessity of helping oneself? Why is it so difficult to make the equivalence that the memorandum, the logic behind the memorandum on Greece is the same logic that privatizes healthcare in Romania, privatizes the highways in Croatia, uh, attacks labor rights in Italy, or evicts people in Spain. Perhaps, Jerome, I, I would start from you on this. Yeah, uh, my answer would be that basically, you know, we've been told that this Europe is about solidarity and cooperation, but in reality, it's actually a very divisive instrument of the ruling class to basically play different European countries and working classes from different European countries apart by pitching them in a fierce competition amongst each other, and by basically allowing, especially German capital, to use the single currency as a surplus recycling mechanism. You know? um, what we're seeing, I think, is that the European Union is producing greater, or the European Monetary Union in particular, is producing greater uh, rivalry and opposition and nationalisms than we had before the European Monetary Union. So what we have to question in the first place is, you know, is this type of European integration really European to begin with? And I think the answer is no. So what we have to start doing is to start rethinking from the very basis um, what it would mean to, you know, really integrate Europe along the lines of, you know, popular culture and popular power. And I think that would really have to come from the bottom up and the particular concrete forms that it will take is something that we'll have to discuss over the, over the months and years ahead. Costas. As many people have commented, while the European elites have become fully Europeanized and they go to Brussels to get uh, various grants and to be part of the so-called comitology in the various committees of the European Union, a European demos has not been created. Mm -hmm. The idea of a common European culture, of a common European origin that in a sense can play the role of a cultural common ground has not happened. And to that extent, going back to the point that uh, Sesco was making earlier, Ho Chi Minh perhaps, it is important for each one of us to fight in their own countries, to fight within their own movements, and so on. Internationalism is one of the greatest traditions of the left. It is precisely about solidarity. It is not about philanthropy. It's not about humanitarian gifts. It is about standing up with people in other countries because we have common interests. And let's close with the last question uh, along, along these lines. One minute for each of you to uh, give a proposition uh, and a direction forwards. Greece has done, regardless of the opinion that one may have about Syriza, has done an enormous amount of work in reinstating the attempt to create a rupture in Europe and to transform the structures of the European Union. But what has everybody else done and what should everybody else do? I would like to close not commenting on Greece, not commenting on Syriza, but commenting on what is the responsibility of Europeans, however you want to define it, to act now. Where should we restart from? Maybe, Stratko, we start with you and we close with Costa. Well, I have such a historical responsibility that <laughs> all this process starts with me. Oh, oh, okay. I would say, I mean, uh, although the defeat or someone call it capitulation is flying above our heads, uh, we should be honest to ourselves and say that um, let's say after, I, I would say there are three 
paradigm shifts which we as the left witnessed as the international left so the first one was of course Porto Alegre and Genova and this World Social Forum tradition meeting each uh, each year in another country in Tunisia and Senegal 50,000 100,000 people and so on uh, where I think we also came to some walls uh, where we have seen that it's not really a new international uh, they don't they didn't uh, the World Social Forum didn't have the strength to question the status quo and so on and it was mainly networking uh, organizing making plans and so on then in 2011 uh, we, we have a new shift and this is what uh, what uh, uh, Costas uh, in his book calls the time of I mean history reloaded this is the time of revolution and so on and we have seen all these occupations which are mainly grassroots movements ordinary people uh, from Tahrir Square to Gezi Park Occupy Wall Street but also countries such as Bosnia, for example, where plenums happened, where general assemblies happened, without any political parties and so on. And then we are now in the third paradigm shift, and maybe it's even going now into some new directions, which is that new political parties have been created, not only Syriza, but Podemos, but also in Slovenia and so on. And what is to be done is, I think, that all these three shifts or paradigmas should be combined. On the one hand, we need internationalism, and I think Syriza and Podemos haven't worked enough on it. Although they created, they were a catalyst, they, they created a huge space. But the thing is, you know, when you come in government in Greece, you don't really have the capability to still work on all these other fields because the country is collapsing. And for the last days, for example, the banks don't work. So it's very difficult. And just to conclude, you know, the other thing is, again, which brings us back to, to the movements. We need to be in contact with social movements all the time and not to fall into the, the trap of the old political parties from the 70s. And the third is, of course, yes, we have to think about power. <laughs> because uh, I think this changed finally in the left, in the international left. We are not afraid anymore of power, in the sense that we know if we want to make things, if we want to change things, yes, sometimes we have to sit on the table with Merkel and Schäuble and so on. But the real question, of course, is, and we've seen it with Syriza, what do we do at the table? <laughs> I think now is the time for Plan C. Um, why? Because we've seen a left that's been not necessarily divided, but at least it has theoretically, um, and also in terms of strategy and, and practice, has sort of divided itself between this, you know, not taking power versus taking power route. Um, we've also seen a uh, dual strategy within Syriza itself. Uh, do we stay in the euro? Do we go out the euro? And I think it's time to shatter those dichotomies and really take the struggle to a whole new level and start working on the base of a new paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people talking these days about the commons. Um, uh, as a you know, as an alternative form of um, organizing, self-organizing, an alternative form even of property uh, relations, and I think that we should really start exploring these type of alternatives. And I think that even under a memorandum government, there will be opportunities for this because this is something that a comes from the grassroots up, and b that a left government, as long as it remains in power, can in one way or another support, right? So it's really important that we start thinking of what would it mean to actually involve people in the actual processes of social change and to create that space and to provide that hope for people to stand forward. And you know, that will is there. The constituent power, as Costas mentioned, is there. Um, the desire to participate is there. Um, the greatest threat at this particular moment is the demobilization as a result of the complete resignation of the people. So if a government of the left manages to stay into power, it should inspire the people and it should give that space and it should create those opportunities for Plan C to, to start taking shape. But the Plan C ultimately rests, the responsibility for this rests with the people. I mean, it can only come from the bottom up. Yes, um, I would like to talk about the reinvention of the left. Um, I don't think that uh, we have a perspective if we continue thinking in uh, social movements if we had them in the practice of demonstrations only in the practice of protest as addressing the power in order for them to give us something uh, I think people are um, more advanced than that you can see that the political parties um, that are uh, evolving are try to, uh, to be new types of parties, Podemos tries to do this, but also Pepe Grillo, even if it's a not good party, but you see that people um, want don't want to be identified uh, with only political identities as we knew them, as campaigning as we knew them. Um, I think it has to do with the primate of practice, so people want to do something in their everyday life and not only propagating 
uh, rhetorics uh, and slogans. Uh, you can see that also in the cultural field, you have a huge cultural field, people are very active and they, were, they are very rarely part, really, as they were in the avant-garde in the 20s, where the art field and the popular movements, they went together, there's still not really uh, a link, a successful link there. What has happened since the beginning of 2015 is the start of what we can call an arc of virtue. We on the left have learned really hard, in a hard way, over 50 years, a series of instances of theoretical failure and political defeat. We have failed and we have defeated again and again and again. And as everyone said earlier, it was the people in Greece, in Spain, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Turkey, in Brazil, who were well ahead, both of the great theories, radical theories of the time, but also ahead of political leaders, political parties of the left. And it has started changing. The arc of virtue, I call it. Look at Turkey. The huge victory for the Kurdish and leftist party in Turkey, which now is challenging the Erdogan rule. Then we move to Greece. Then we move to Spain. And of course, we expect and hope that Podemos will win. But the victories in the local elections were amazing, particularly in Madrid, which was the center of the Francoist regime. And then we move to Ireland. And then, of course, to Scotland, that needs to be emphasized again and again and again. And we have, to a certain extent, to celebrate that and see how the lesson we've learned over the last five years, not just in the last five months in Greece, the lessons of success and the lessons of failure and of defeat and capitulation, how these lessons can be put into practice in everyone's home, in everyone's country, in everyone's city. This is how internationalism and transnationalism will start again. If we start winning small victories at the beginning and hopefully bigger victories later. We have a resurrection or a revival of history. We were told that history ended in 1989. History has started moving again. And this is the place which, in which, as it were, that revival of history is at its highest point. So let us go away having a little hope. Let us Keep to our melancholia, you have to be neurotic in order to be a standard person, keep to our melancholia, but also see that possibilities have opened again, and the way I would put it, from Sintagma 2011 to Sintagma 2015, and the democracy to come. This is the position that I'd like us to live with. Perfect. History has started again. We started from there is no alternative. Now I think there is broad agreement in Europe that there is no staying put with the status quo. The instability that's been inserted into the structural dynamic of the European Union represents an opportunity. We may win, we may lose, but at least we can fight. We are in Athens uh, at a historical moment, but we're also in Athens at a very important conference that's bringing activists and theorists from across the globe to discuss over four days. We close, as usual, with an interview with the organizer of the conference, Creston Davis. What is democracy? What does it mean for democracy to rise? Is it rising or is it declining? This is the question. These are the many sets of questions that we here in Athens are convening to ask. My name is Creston Davis, and I'm the founding director of the Global Center for Advanced Studies. It's a school that we founded with uh, many theorists and activists around the world. A school committed to the idea of democracy. A school committed not to a party, not to, uh, neither to uh, an uprising, but rather a mediation between uprisings in the world from Occupy to the Arab Spring to Athens to Frankfurt to all over the world. These uprisings, the school is connecting the uprisings with um, the question of organization, a, a pedagogical organization that unites various people from all over the world. We have 45 different uh, countries already participating in what we're doing. We want you to participate as well.